morning, y'all. Good to see you today. Thanks so much for, thanks so much for being here. We are uh, continuing on in our series called Psalms Playlist. We're in week four of that. We'll be doing that all throughout the summer. Um, this week's psalm is, uh, I am convinced, about depression. And um, it's not a topic that we talk about a lot in church. Maybe we should talk about it more considering uh, the numbers of people who are affected by depression. Depression affects over 18 million adults in the United States. That's one in 10 in any given year. Um, it's the primary reason why someone dies of suicide about every 12 minutes, which is a staggering fact. Over 41,000 people a year. It affects over 300 million people worldwide, regardless of culture, age, gender, religion, race, or economic status. And so it's a huge problem in our world, and it's one that, um, that the church hasn't quite known how to deal with because we either deal with it by saying, hey, you just, you know, you need to pray more, or uh, you need to have more faith, or, or whatever, um, or if you really love Jesus, you wouldn't be dealing with this, right? And so I don't think that's uh, fair or realistic, or I don't even think it's biblical. So um, let's look and see a passage that is directly related to depression, and let's see the way that the psalmist handled this, because I think it can have a lot to say to us, because chances are, if those numbers are correct, there are people in this room who are dealing with depression. I'm sorry about that, um, but it's probably the sad fact, and um, I want you to know that we see you, and, um, and the Bible has something to say to you too, all right? So, let's read this psalm together, Psalm 13. It is a psalm of David, so it was written by David. We don't know the circumstances under which he wrote it, um, but we do know a lot about David's life, and we knew, do know that he had many seasons where he could have been depressed. He had seasons where he was running from Saul and hiding in caves, and that was a prolonged season of his life. Um, we know that he had seasons where his family was a mess, his children were a mess, and he was dealing with all of the fallout from that, and that certainly could have been a depressing season of his life. We know that there were seasons of his life where he sinned, and he was dealing with that sin and uh, fell in a major way and had to deal with his own weakness. And so that certainly could have been a season of depression. We don't know which one he was going through here, but we know that it was very real. And this is the way it starts. It says, To the choir master, a psalm of David, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Amen. So let's look at what this psalm is truly about, how it breaks down, and what we can learn from it. First of all, we see his condition in the very first part of this psalm. First couple of verses, we see his condition, and his condition is he's depressed. I mean, look at the things he says. How long will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul, have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? His condition is undoubtedly one of depression. I'll read to you the clinical definition of depression, and you tell me if it lines up with the first part of this psalm. It, depression is when a person experiences a prolonged depressed mood, i.e. feeling sad, irritable, empty, that is often accompanied by a loss of pleasure or interest in activities. 
Sounds pretty much like the first part of this passage, doesn't it? The guy is depressed. And in this particular psalm, we can conclude that depression is a prolonged feeling of being forgotten and forlorn. It's a prolonged feeling of being forgotten and forlorn. We know it's prolonged because he keeps saying over and over again, how long, right? How long will you forget me, God? How long will you hide your face from me? How long do I have to go through this? Now, if he's just dealing with this for like a couple of hours, he's not going, how long? But he's dealing with this for days, weeks, months, maybe. And he's saying, am I going to have to go through this forever, God? Am I going to have to feel this way forever? How long is this going to last? Because I can hardly take it anymore. How long? So we know it's prolonged. And it's not just prolonged. It's also accompanied by a feeling of being forgotten, which is often the truth of depression. A lot of people who feel depressed feel like they are forgotten. And he says, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? When we're going through depression, we often feel forgotten. We feel like nobody cares. And and what's worse, we sometimes feel like God doesn't care and that we've been forgotten by God. And so we start asking questions like this. Why isn't anyone calling me? Why doesn't anyone care about me? Why, how come nobody comes to visit? Why do I see all these people on social media having a great time? Why wasn't I invited? And so we start to feel like we've been forgotten. And I think the hardest one of all is we feel like at times, God, why did you forget about me? So... It's a prolonged feeling of being forgotten and forlorn. He says, how long will you hide your face from me? And the reason I use the word forlorn is because it means to be sad and lonely, especially because of being left alone. And what David is expressing here is that God's not even looking at him, right? Uh, Our son Pierce, our child with autism, one of the ways that we learn to, um, to discipline him, because we couldn't discipline him like we could a typical child. And one of the ways that we learned to discipline him is we would have him sit, crisscross applesauce, right? And we would turn our back to him. And he'd have to sit, and he couldn't see our face. And it drove him crazy. He, he, he hated it. I mean, he felt like, oh, why aren't they looking at me? Why aren't they giving me attention? And that's what David is expressing here. He, he hates this feeling that God is not looking at him. He's not giving him attention. God, why aren't you giving me attention? I need your attention right now. I need your face. And so he's feeling this prolonged feeling of being forgotten and forlorn. I felt that way before of you. I felt that way. I felt that way this week, (laughs) you know, with all the church scandals in Dallas and what's going on there. I know many of you have followed the ministries of Tony Evans and Robert Morris, and those have been important in your lives and two important ministries, two of the largest ministries, not only in Dallas, but in the country. And, um, Watching those guys step down, it's a little depressing for a lot of us, right? I tell you what, these are interesting times in uh, the church, aren't they? Interesting times. I believe that God is uh, he's teaching us what it means to really follow him. And you know what he's teaching us in the church more than anything? He's teaching us that we better be honest and real and transparent about the whole truth. Because hiding and spinning and saying our version of the truth doesn't work. It just causes damage. So, I think we need to learn. By the way, I wrote a big post on Facebook. If you want to see how I feel about this, go read it. But I know that a lot of you are hurting over this, and I'm sorry. 
Um, and I'm thankful for the grace of God. I'll tell you that much. So we all feel this prolonged feeling of being forgotten and forlorn. We all feel this sense that at times that we may be forgotten or that God has turned his face. And if you, if you haven't felt that way, um, good. I'm glad for you. I think I'm glad for you. Or you're hiding something. Um, in which case, I'm not glad for you. But as I've often told you in the past, here's the deal. You can't trust your feelings, right? You can't trust your feelings. And I think what we see in this psalm that we have to be very careful about is what, we, what David is writing about here is very real. But is he writing about the reality of God or is he writing about the reality of himself? And I think what he's doing is he's writing about the reality of himself and what he feels. Because the things that he expresses about God are things that we know aren't necessarily true of God, right? I mean, look at what Isaiah 49, 15, and 16 says about God. It says, Zion said, Zion, by the way, is Israel. Zion said, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. But look at God's response. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget you, I will not forget you. See, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. So that's the truth about God. The truth about God is if you think about a mother who's breastfeeding a child, can she forget about that child and not care about that child? No. He says, even if she could, I'm not her. I'm better. I won't forget you. I always see you because I've engraved you on the palms of my hands. For Mother's Day, I got my wife a little necklace. She wanted it real bad. She was telling me all about it. I got the hint. And... Uh, <laughs> I got her necklace, and it has all of our kids' names on it, you know, and she wears it often. And so it made me think of this, like that's the way God feels about you. He has you, he, he has your names engraved on his hand. He, he knows you, he doesn't forget you, he sees you. But those feelings that we have can be very real, and they can overshadow even the truth about God. And so depression is a real thing. It, it is a difficult thing, and sometimes it overshadows. Um, I love what Alistair Begg said. He said, God's care for his children is like the sun. It's constant. Even though the clouds obscure it, it doesn't mean the sun isn't there. It's always there. Just go above the clouds. It reminded me of the times that I've flown before in the past, and you fly and you get to this place where you can't see the sun, all you see is the clouds around you, and then eventually you get to this cruising altitude where you're above the clouds and you see the beauty of the sun and the beauty of the world, and it's clear. And I believe that that's the way God's love for us is. It's always constant, but sometimes the circumstances, sometimes our feelings, sometimes what we're going through, can cloud over the sun, and it's hard to see the Lord. And it can feel like he's forgotten or he's turned his face. But he really hasn't. He sees you and he knows you. So the first thing that we see is David's condition. Second thing we see is his cry. Now, most of us hate to cry. It can be a little bit embarrassing, and especially for us guys, sometimes it feels weak. And so we don't typically like to cry. We fight crying. But in this case, and in many cases, crying can be totally appropriate. And depression usually comes with tears. And so David cries out. And David knows this lesson very well in Psalm 32, 3. He says, when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. 
In other words, what he's saying is, don't keep it all inside, because if you keep it all inside, you're, you'll deteriorate from the inside out. Your bones will waste away. And so David is letting it all out to the Lord, and he comes to the Lord in prayer through his crying, and he says to the Lord, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemies say I have prevailed over him. Lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. So in his cry, he says a couple of things. First of all, consider me and answer me. He's like, look at me. That's what consider me means. Look at me. Cast your gaze upon me. Consider me and answer me. And I think this kind of persistent faith is important. That when you're feeling down, when you're feeling this prolonged sense of forgottenness and forlornness, I think it's important that you cry out to the Lord in honesty and you tell Him how I'm feeling and you, how you're feeling, and you tell Him what you want from Him. God, consider me and answer me. And you're persistent about that. I think that kind of persistent faith is important. Nobody wants to have to work to get someone's attention. But sometimes when you work to get someone's attention, it shows how desperate you are for them. And I think God wants us to come to him as desperate people who need him. And a lot of times when we get depressed, we'll just stop. We'll just give up. We'll stop coming to him. And I think David is showing us here, hey, keep coming to the Lord. Keep coming to him out of desperation. Cry to God. Ask God to consider and answer you. And he makes an interesting request here. He says, light up my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. In other words, turn the light on. Turn the light on. If you think about David and his life and what he went through, he spent these prolonged periods of time in dark places, watching sheep at night, hiding from Saul in caves. Um, you know, he, he didn't live in a time where there was electricity. And so he's out in the middle of nowhere, oftentimes in a cave, and there's no light. And that's scary. If you've ever been out in the dead of night, out in the middle of nowhere, and there's no light, it's scary. And so he's saying, turn the light on. Some of you may remember this about your children or about maybe uh, brothers or sisters. Um, I remember when we were teaching our kids to sleep in their own bed. We would tuck them into bed, and they would say, Daddy, will you please leave the light on? And I would say, okay, yeah, I'll leave the light on. But in a couple of weeks, we're going to work to try and get the light off, right? So in a couple of weeks, we would turn the light off, and they'd say, Daddy, can you please leave the closet light on and the door open? Yeah, we can do that. And then eventually we would say, hey, let's, let's turn the closet light off now. And they would say, Daddy, will you leave the bathroom light on and leave the door open? Yeah, I'll do that. Or will you put a night light in? We, light, we want light. Because dark, darkness is scary. And so what David is saying here is, God, turn the light on because it's so dark right now. And I don't want to fall asleep and not wake up. I don't want to sleep the sleep of death. I need some light in my world. I'm afraid. So turn the light on, Lord. We all get to that point at times where we need the Lord to turn the light on. We're scared, we're struggling in the dark, and we need consideration, and we need to turn the light on. Now the final point this morning, and this is a progression The progression goes from David's condition, I'm depressed, to David's cry, I'm I'm praying to you, Lord, out of desperation. I need you to answer me and turn the light on. 
to finally David's consolation in the end. And that progression is important. We recognize honestly our condition. We go to the Lord honestly in our cry of desperation, and we receive from the Lord consolation. And this is what the consolation looks like. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. And what makes this psalm so compelling is the fact that verse 5 and 6 give no indication of anything having changed in David's life. Right? It gives no indication that his circumstance has gotten better or worse or changed at all. But just through coming to the Lord with honesty and recognizing his condition and getting it out in his cry, then he receives consolation. And he prays a very honest prayer. He cries about this long period of depression. And then he does three willful things that are super important if you're facing depression. Three choices. First of all, he trusts. But I trust in your unfailing love. He trusts. And when you're down, sometimes you just have to trust God more than you trust your feelings or your circumstances. You have to trust that God is bigger and more powerful than how you're feeling. And you'll have to keep trusting that over and over and over again. It's not a one-time thing. It's an ongoing, willful choice to trust the Lord. And what does he trust in? His unfailing love. Now, if you're depressed, I can't think of a better thing for you to trust in. The unfailing love of God. That he loves you even though you're depressed. That he's going to keep loving you even though you're depressed. And that his love is unfailing. That's what you really need when you're down. You need to know that there's someone whose love is unfailing. And that's part of going above the, the clouds and seeing the sun is that you see that God's love doesn't fail. It never fails. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Neither height nor depth, nor angels nor demons, nor uh, there's a whole bunch of other things, right? Nothing could separate us. Romans 8. And so he is consoled by his trust in the Lord. Secondly, he rejoices. He makes the willful decision to rejoice. And the hardest thing to do when you're down is to rejoice. But here's what I would do if I were you and I were down and I were depressed. What I would do is I would take inventory of the things around you. And that's where you get real basic. Say, I'm not doing real good, but I'm going to take inventory right now. i got a roof over my head. i got clothes on my back. i bed to sleep in. And you start there. You start with the most basic things. i got food to eat. I don't feel like eating, but i got it. It's here, right? And you start with basic things that you rejoice in. You rejoice in the fact that there are things around you that are worth celebrating. There are good things around you, and you remind yourself that there are good things. In this case, he rejoices in his salvation. That's the best thing. He rejoices in the fact that he's saved. And what he's recognizing there is that there is life after this. That there's more to life than the depression that you're going through right now. That there's more than just the circumstances that you're facing right now. There is salvation, which means that you have eternity, which means that there will come a time where you will not be depressed anymore. And all the bad things will come undone, and you can rest in the goodness of God. And that goodness will be made manifest. So he trusts, he rejoices, and then finally he praises. He praises, says, I will sing the Lord's praise. 
for he has been good to me. I like the pro- progression here. He trusts, God, I believe in you and your unfailing love. Then he rejoices, God, you've saved me, and I'm so thankful that even though my world is falling apart, I have my salvation in you. And then he praises, God, you've been good to me, and now my heart and my mouth is actually singing. Because you're bringing light into the darkness of my depression. I know that not all of you in here are singers, right? Not everybody likes to do that, but I'll I'll tell you this, even if you're not very musical, there's something about music that is very therapeutic to your soul. My daughter texted me, she just flew to New York, and uh, she t- I said, how'd the flight go? And she said, uh, I was really scared at one point, and, and I had convinced myself that I was about to die. Um, so I put on a Christian playlist and listened to the music, and I got everything got quite a bit better, and it was good. And I said, well, I'm glad you convinced yourself that, you're, that you weren't going to die, you know. And it was music. It was listening to, to the words of the Lord through music that brought her to a different place, right? That showed her that her emotions were lying to her. And I think that's an important part of things. I'll often sing. I sing all the time. I like to sing. and I am somewhat musical, so I, I sing all the time. Uh, sometimes when I'm walking, when I'm taking my walks, I'll start singing, and I know the people at the park that I walk in are looking at me like I'm crazy. But I have my headphones on. I, I, don't, I tuned them out. I just sing just because. It does good for my soul, and it does good for your soul. It's why we sing here, by the way. Part of the reason why we sing together is so with all these different voices and all these different talent levels musically, we can come together and make a joyful noise to the Lord and recognize the things that are true about him. And as we do so, it should ideally shift your mood. It's not there for you to do this. All right? Guys, it's there for you to sing. And when you do, when you allow yourself to do that, you don't have to do it loud. When you allow yourself to do that, something in your heart opens up and you find yourself praising God in a way that is good and therapeutic for you, for your soul. It's it's something that God uses. So a breakthrough, I believe, happens when we trust, rejoice, and praise. It's a choice, and it's an ongoing choice, and here's what I don't want you to hear today. I'm depressed, so Pastor Steve thinks I just need to trust, rejoice, and praise, and then I'll be fixed Right, the depression will go away. That's not, that may happen. But here's what, here's what a prolonged sense of depression requires. It re- requires a prolonged trusting, rejoicing, and praising. It's not a one-time thing. It's not you do it once and you're fixed. It's you do it over and over and over and over again. And every time you wake up with depression, every time you combat it with trust, rejoicing, and praise, it's hard. It's not easy. It's not, there's not a magic trick I can tell you that, oh, here, this just takes it away. And you know how I know that? Because David writes about this a bunch of times in the Psalms. He writes a whole bunch of Psalms about this. So what it should tell you is this. Just because you deal with depression doesn't mean that you're not spiritual. It doesn't mean that you're not spiritually mature. It doesn't mean that you can't have a vibrant relationship with Christ. It just means that you have a struggle like all of us do. And it means you fight that struggle like we all do with any struggle with the truth. And the truth comes in trusting the Lord, rejoicing in Him, and praising Him even in the midst of it. And knowing that one day it won't be a struggle anymore.
My prayer for you and for me is that we would trust, rejoice, and praise. Y'all pray with me. God, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that um, we don't open it up and find um, we don't find things that are irrelevant to our lives. Instead, we open it up like we did today and we find a psalm that actually um, puts to words a lot of what our hearts feel. And so we praise you for that, God. I mean, the fact that David wrote this so long ago and it still resonates with us so deeply, it just shows us that you are real and you know what you're doing and you're alive. And so we praise you for that, God. Teach us, Lord, how to fight this battle against depression, against our own mind and emotions and heart. Teach us, Lord, um, how to trust you, how to rejoice in you, how to praise you even during the struggle. And as we do so, Lord, continue to shape our hearts into, um, into what you want us to be. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, Lord. Thank you that just like a, a mother can't forget the baby that she's nursing, you don't forget us. Just like a mother wouldn't leave that baby helpless, you don't leave us. Thank you, God, for caring so deeply about us. We trust you, we rejoice in you, we praise you. And we're going to praise you now. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all stand with me this morning and, and let's praise the Lord. Let's practice this now. Let's let our voices be heard. Let's sing out. Don't, don't care about who's around you. <laughs> don't be bothered about what you may or may not sound like. Just sing to the Lord. Praise Him. Because He's worthy. He loves you. Let's praise Him together. If you need to talk or pray, I'll be up here. Feel free to come. Natalie will be here too. If you want to come and light a candle this morning just to do something out of your seat, feel free to do that too. Maybe that's your way this morning of flying above the clouds and seeing the sun. Uh, maybe you need to do that. Whatever you need to do, let's praise Him together.